The louder the better. I just yell. We are live. We are live. Hey everybody, I'm Christine Danchuk and I'm here with Frank Korea. And it's that time again. We are here to answer your tech questions. We're here to help you out, guys. So go ahead and type in a technical question regarding your Tri-5. All right, so we're gonna start from a question we had last week. Uh, Dennis Ed Erdman is asking, is it mandatory to use a proportioning valve with the CPP Corvette style master cylinder? So uh, it's a dual master cylinder. You do have to use a proportioning valve if you're putting disc brakes in the front, but still using the drum brakes in the back. Uh, the disc brakes require much more pressure to operate than a drum brake. So you wouldn't want to put the exact same pressure to both brakes at the same time, or your drum brakes are going to lock up and possibly you could skid out of control in a panic stop. So the proportioning valve is there to cut the pressure to the rear drum to let those disc brakes up front and give you a chance to work uh, and stop you a little faster without getting out of control. Um, so that's mainly what the proportioning valve is doing for you. Um, and of course, you're changing to a dual master cylinder. All right, okay, so while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, let's start with, an, or let's uh, go over another question from last week. John Phillips wants to know what headers are recommended for a big block? Well, most of the headers that we have right now in our catalog are got some restrictions. Uh, you have to have an automatic transmission. They will not work with like a Muncie four speed or any kind of manual transmission uh, because they won't clear the clutch linkage. Uh, so that's a restriction right there that you know, a lot of guys like to use manual transmissions. Uh, you got um, uh, the Doug's headers is probably a, a nicer, much nicer header than the Patriot. Um, they seem to work a little bit better. So you're gonna need to pay attention to the footnotes for the header uh, and make sure it fits your criteria. All right, okay, thanks Frank. I think I have this up correctly. I'm waiting for you guys to type in your questions. So go ahead, type in your questions, you guys. We're only here for a half hour. All right, um, let's see here. From last week, we had Don Van Bergogian, and he wants to know, will headliner bows is it bows or bows? Bows. Okay. Well, headliner bows, uh, our part number, 16474 for Nomads, work on a 55 sedan delivery? Chances are they may not have the right contour. Uh, nomads have a lower roof line, like you, uh, when you're comparing uh, a sport coupe to a sedan, uh, the roof skims uh, are a little bit lower profile. So trying to convert it, I, I to be honest with you, I haven't ever tried, but I doubt if all seven bows are gonna actually uh, have the same curvature as that roof. Um, but if you can keep the bows away from the roof skin um, and keep them rel relatively straight and even, uh, there's a good chance you can make it work. Um, but then, uh, the headliner is going to probably have to be custom made for that application. All right, great, thanks, Frank. Okay, guys, let's get some questions going. Uh, well, uh, some other questions that we had, um, or that we have from you guys, from customers calling in, we're going to go over those right now. So um, let's answer. Let's try this question. What is the difference between a hard top and a sedan? post or no post models? Okay, um, we usually have to go over this every once in a while. Um, you know, the Sport Coupe was a car that GM designed with no post, no B-pillar post between your two side windows. You need to have, so the Sport Coupe, or in, in other words, a hard top, they call it too. Um, uh, sometimes you get that confused. Uh, without the pillar, and the windows roll down, 
it was supposed to look like a convertible from a distance away. It's a sportier car. So that a lot of people like to call it a sport coupe. Uh, the sedan has a B pillar between those two side windows that go to the roof. So um, those are the fastest ways to tell between a sedan and a hardtop. Thanks, Frank. All right. All right, next question. What are the color differences between glass? Uh, for example, clear, tinted, and smoked. So General Motors never had smoked glass back in the day. Um, it was just the clear glass and the upgraded green tinted glass. Clear glass was your typical glass, mostly put in your cheaper model cars, 150 model cars to be exact. Uh, you might see some of the two tins. Uh, very seldom did you see clear glass in a Bel Air. So green, easy eye glass is what GM called it, was a 10% green tint to keep out some of that glare out of your eyes. Um, the glass, the green glass would have been put in most of the Bel Airs and typically you see it in a lot of two tins as well. And then. Now the glass manufacturers have come out with uh, smoke glass. It's smoke in the glass. It's not a film. So smoke is gonna be considered more of a uh, custom application, uh, which a lot of uh, street rod builds are starting to use the smoke glass more often. So do you think that's more popular then, the smoke glass? With the hot rodders, the, okay. the, the custom cars, they're, they're using the smoke glass more and more. Just remember, if you want somebody to see your uh, expensive interior, it's going to be harder to see through a smoke glass opposed to a green or a, or a, a clear glass. Cool. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go on to Will Stippleton has, can I use a sedan door skin on my 56 Nomad? Yeah. Actually, since they don't make a Nomad door skin yet, um, a lot of people think that you're supposed to use a sport coupe door skin because the uh, uh, door appears to look like a sport coupe, but in reality it's not. It actually is a sedan door skin. Uh, Nomad doors are completely straight across the belt line like a sedan, whereas a sport coupe starts to dip in the back of the door. That's why it won't work. So yeah, you need to have a sedan door skin. Now, there is a small modification that has to be made in the belt area, but it is the skin that would have to be used. Great, thanks. Okay, so Tad Todd has just a question about the flippers for 57 hardtop. Are those available yet? No, uh, actually I just um, looked yesterday um, on their uh, manufacturer's website and they're still on the discontinuum they call temporarily discontinued. Uh, supposedly they're redoing the tooling for them and we're gonna try to come out with them. So they still show them on their website, but they still show them temporarily discontinued right now. Okay, great, thanks. All right guys, let's see here. Go ahead and uh, type in your questions, you guys. We're only here for um, less than a half hour now, so this is your time to uh, contact us and let us know what you have, um, any questions you have regarding your Tri-5 because we're here to help you out. All right, let's 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 answer this question. What about, what is the difference between original power steering and 500 power steering? Well, the original GM power steering in these cars used what they called a slave cylinder or a hydraulic cylinder to push and pull the steering wheel back and forth for you. Um, yes, it's very early prehistoric kind of steering. Um, it works, um, it helps, um, but the 500 box is late model technology. It's what you're gonna find in newer cars um, and race cars as well. Uh, there's some race cars that are using that technology in their cars. So the power is in the box, it's not down below on the steering linkage and you're able to put the power steering box on your stock manual steering linkage. You don't have to modify the linkage at all if it's a manual car now. Do people still use the original power steering? Yeah, they will. They, um, uh, it's not 
it works, but you can get a lot of leaks in the system. It, it wasn't a real proven system back then, so uh, people sometimes have problems with the valve leaking, and I guess when they get tired of the leak uh, on the floor, then they're going to go to the newer models. But if you want to keep your car original, it's the way to go. You just need to re, you know, make sure the system is all in good, good uh, standing because you need to sometimes rebuild the valve. Sometimes the ram cylinder needs to, needs new seals. Uh, as long as the ram cylinder shaft is not bent or scored up real bad, you just need to put new seals in that. That's that's a simple job. Valve's a little bit more technical. Um, sometimes you have to send them out and have those rebuilt. Great. Okay, let's see here. We have a question. Can I put a serpentine belt set up on my stock 20 or 283 engine, sorry, 283 engine. So there's a lot of manufacturers doing serpentine systems today. Uh, typically most of those systems are utilizing the bolt holes at the bottom of the block on each side of the harmonic balancer. Um, just recently I got off the phone with somebody uh, that had a 283 I had him look at the engine block to make sure if it were a, a early 283 or a late model 283. Because there is some late model 283s, which wouldn't have not came in these cars, that had side motor mounts. So side motor, you have to have side motor mounts typically to put a serpentine system in because their bracketry needs the two mounting positions at the bottom where your front motor mounts used to be. I don't see trying to put front motor mounts on top of a serpentine bracket kit. Uh, the brackets are usually quite heavy duty and thick, and I doubt if that's gonna uh, fit on top of it. So um, it, it pretty much requires side motor mounts in order to put almost anybody's serpentine system on. Okay, oh you guys, okay, um, I have a customer here saying that he can't hear us very good. Um, I guess we'll have to speak up a little louder, okay? So I hope you guys can hear us now. Um, all right, so let's see here. What is a belt line molding and where is it located? So the belt line molding is the molding that's at the base of your side windows. So the way that actually came upon uh, the name is the uh, belt line is going to be, uh, it was made by, or actually named by one of the designers at Chevrolet. The designer was standing next to the car, and he was a tall gentleman, by the way, he was over six feet tall, and apparently his belt line of his belt on his pants was right at the base of the glass. So they were, um, so some, uh, just seeing that on this uh, uh, side of the car, he just named it the belt line molding instead of just the side window trim. Uh, and that's, you know, people get confused that, you know, it's down below on the side of the car, but it's actually there on the uh, uh, belt line of the uh, bottom of the window. Okay, great, window. thanks. All right, Joe Mullen has a question. He wants to know, where can I find the alignment specs for a 55 Chevy with tubular control arms and a 500 steering box? Um, yeah, the alignment specs, I don't believe too many of the manufacturers are putting those in the box. Um, there used to be one manufacturer that did. He would have the toe in would be original, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch of toe-in, which is original. The camber would actually be at zero, and you want to run it no more than plus or minus a half degree either direction. But then when it comes to the caster, most of these tubular A-arms are made with the five degrees positive caster. So you want to have the alignment die set it as close to the five degrees as possible, and you don't want to go past a half degree positive or negative on that either. Um, and that should do a couple things. It's going to allow
allow uh, no more drifting on the road, which they call bump steer. Um, the steering wheel is going to return back to center when you go around turns. If you're in a parking lot, your steering wheel should return back to center without uh, you having to help it too much, just like you do in your newer cars. Okay. All right, guys, we're waiting for some more questions. Go ahead and type in your question. Uh, Frank, have you heard anything this week? Anybody call in regarding any questions you want to talk about? Any technical things that you think would uh, help out our customers? Well, we did one of them with the serpentine pulley system. That was a call I just got off not too long ago. Um, but um, I get questions, all different questions. You know, the, the, how do we take the heater box out of my car? You know, um, you know what bolts are gonna do it? There's there's just a couple bolts on the firewall. I just did a 56 uh, just the other day. Took the deluxe heater out. So you got you know two simple bolts on the firewall. You got a sheet metal screw on the inside above the transmission tunnel um, to release the box. And then around the blower motor, you've got three studs, uh, three more nuts on the firewall that, that releases the motor uh, off the firewall. So, I mean, uh, I get so many different questions about things. Sometimes they're real simple. Sometimes they're kind of difficult and I even have to think about it for a minute, especially if it's something I haven't done. And uh, how do you know so much, Frank? It's just over the years, you just like, well, acquired so much knowledge just from talking to our customers. You're so smart course, with all this. Most of my knowledge is on the 55 through 57 Chevys. It all started when I bought my own 55 Chevy over 25 years ago. And I drove that Chevy for almost 10 years as my daily driver. So I had to maintain it. If I wanted a heater in the winter months, I wanted to make sure I could drive it to uh, uh, 100 miles from home, I had to maintain it. I had to get back and forth to work and get around in it. So it was a dependable car. It was just as dependable as any, any other car. And from doing that, I started working on other people's cars in my driveway first. Um, started mostly doing disc brake conversions. That was the number one thing back when I started, was everybody wanted disc brakes put on their car, you know, and the front end rebuilt at the same time. Do you still have your 55? Yeah, my 55, I still have the same car. It's got a new paint job, it's got a new engine. It's uh, probably about, ooh, I would say it's almost three quarters of the way back together. I've uh, got a few more things I gotta do, and uh, hopefully I can drive it back here to Dan Chuck again. Yeah, I gotta like I see it, to. I wanna see yeah, it. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. How do I know if I have a short water pump or a long pump? Um, there is a measurement in our catalog to help you measure from the engine block out. I believe by memory, the long pump is a seven inch reach from the, from the face of the block to the flange on the front of the pump. And the short water pump is five and five eighths. If you want, if, without even take, taking a tape measure, you can look at the distance between the back side of the water pump and the front face of the timing chain cover. I typically look at that. Short pumps are crammed right up against the timing chain cover. A long pump, you can almost stick your hand in between the two. That's the fast and quick way to tell. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay. All right, Steve Duncan has a question. And you guys, if you can't hear us, just let us know by typing in on the comment section. Uh, we, we, we're mic'd up, but um, and we're trying to speak loud, so uh, just let us know, okay? Because we want you to be able to hear our questions. All right, any tips or tricks for replacing window regulators on a 56 two-door sedan? Taking the window regulator out and replacing it, um, you know, on these doors, no matter if it's a sedan or a hardtop, um, to get the regulator out, you typically have to take this complete vent window assembly out. Um, if you want to take your chances, you can undo the stud uh, at the bottom of the vent window division bar, and you'll have to pull it away from the door skin in order to squeeze the regulator out. But you're supposed to take the whole regulator, or I'm sorry, the whole vent window assembly out 
because half of that regulator is behind that division bar and it's tight up against the back side of it. You'll never squeeze it out. Um, I mean, it's, you got four screws to detach the, the window first uh, down below the window. And then once that window is completely out, then you would get your uh, vent window out. And I believe there's a question about a sedan or? Oh yeah, so he has um, a 56 two-door sedan. Okay. So in the sedan, you actually would remove the vent window assembly first, and then you would undo the door window. And then once those two are removed, then you can remove the entire uh, regulator out, which is just four Phillips head pan head screws typically. Um, not, not too difficult. Um, it could be done fairly quick. It's gonna take a little longer to put it back together, but you're gonna do it in reverse order. Uh, you kinda need to get that door window put back in then the vent window on a sedan, uh, vent window goes in last, you gotta work it back into the uh, uh, door. With the door glass down in the bottom of the door is gonna be the easiest too. Is it difficult with all the different uh, 55, 56, and 57, or is it just with the 56? No, all three years is pretty much the same. same. When it comes to the sedan and the station wagons, they're all the same. Okay. Great. Okay, Ronnie has a question. Why is my rack and pinion hitting on my oil pan, oil pan, sorry, 400 SV7 quart pan? Yeah, typically, depending on the brand of rack and pinion, um, I would say that the, between the different brands, the rack and pinion sit at a different height, and that's gonna be one factor. Uh, oil pans, uh, they, there's a lot of different pans, uh, just like they make custom oil pans for these cars for big blocks that have better clearance for the steering linkage. So having an oil pan that is maybe designed to clear linkage better would work a, a little bit better, but it all depends on the engine you got, if it's a small block, big block. Uh, LS engine. So would that affect why it's moving? Because he says here it moved three fourths forward. Would that be, is that because of the engine? That doesn't help either. Yeah, moving the motor three quarters minutes forward because maybe you want an HEI distributor in there. That is yeah making the situation worse because the oil pan typically has a, a curvature to it, and the further you go forward, the more it's getting into that cur that low in the, the curve. Next question, what's easier to install, painless or American? Um, I only use American Auto Wire on the cars because the American Auto Wire is actually made for these cars. It's a Tri-5 Chevy made harness. It comes with all the pigtails, comes with the light bulb sockets. It, it gives you the choices on the dashboard for stock gauges or custom gauges. So for instance, if you still got stock gauges, it's gonna come with all the bulb sockets and all the original style connections for the gauges. Uh, the painless, uh, from what I hear, they're working on improving their uh, uh, whole wiring kit. Um, they realize that their kit is a little more universal where I could almost take their Tri-5 Chevy kit and put it in other cars. Uh, unfortunately, they don't supply the light bulb sockets. So it makes it a little bit more difficult and more costly to get the rest of those connectors and those sockets to make it a complete kit. So I feel that the American Auto Wire is a easier kit to use and their instructions are geared around the Tri-5 Chevys as well. All right, going back to the previous question, Ronnie wants to know what would we recommend, what oil pan would we recommend? Actually, what in, does, does he have the engine? Yeah, he had, he had, well, no, he didn't. He just had the 400 SV, he just broke okay, kind of. Okay, it's a 400 small block. Oh yeah, there, it's seven okay. quart, I'm sorry. I was reading the seven quart. Yeah, so he has a 400 um, small block. Actually, I'd probably have to look into the Milladon pans and see if Milladon has something um, typically depending on your crankshaft too, if it's, if it's got a bigger crank, but um, 
I would say Melodon should have something that would give you a little bit more extra clearance on that. Um, sometimes the manufacturer of the rack and pinion might have something that they recommend as well. Um, you know, not only Melodon, but you also got Moroso too to look at, see if they have anything. Um, the one pen that just comes to mind that might give you more clearance is something for a Nova that was designed to clear that uh, their stern linkage. Okay. All right, guys, time is up. Well, we actually have one more minute, but um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, so we're gonna, um, I guess we'll stop for now. But um, remember, we're here every Friday at one o'clock. And so this is a good time just to get your questions answered. So um, hopefully we'll see you guys next week. And thanks, yeah. Frank. Thanks yeah. for all the great information. Yeah. We'll work on getting a different microphone for this uh, <laughs> setup so you can hear us. We don't have to yell so loud. Um, but uh, um, you know, uh, we got uh, a cell coming up too. Yes, yes. Yeah. I was just going um, um, to go over that. We have a sale. Well, actually, I just want to remind all you guys that the Labor Day sale is going on. And it's going on till a Tuesday, September 8th at midnight. It's an online sale. So you need to go online to the Danchuk website and to purchase your parts. And uh, the sale is for 5% off orders from 99 to 299 or 10% off on orders 299 and up. Okay, of course, there's some restrictions um, that are applied to the sale, but um, just check our website and you'll get all the information. All right, guys, so have a happy Labor Day from all of us here at Dansha. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today, you guys. It's fun. I actually learned something, too, so thanks, Frank, because <laughs> right. I don't know that much about these cars, but I'm learning. Oh. So, um, yeah, so thanks, you guys, for tuning in, and we'll see you next all week. Right. Bye. See you next Friday. Bye.